Hi there, friends and family. We're all part of the family of Jesus Christ and God, the Father, his family. And uh, really looking forward to this topic today. A man told me that in one of the opening prayers at one of their church meetings recently, the man mentioned Jesus clearly speaking to him during the prayer. And then some point afterwards, the pastor told the whole congregation, we are not to pray to Jesus, but just to God the Father, as even Jesus himself said in the Lord's Prayer. Father, when you pray, say, Our Father in heaven. I think that's Matthew 6, verse 9. Some take that to be a command to speak only to Father and never to speak to Jesus himself. Let's examine that. Are many of us possibly sidelining the Son of God in our prayers. Most of you do end your prayers in Jesus' name, saying that phrase. That's wonderful, we should be. But what about actually praying to him? Would that be wrong? That's the question I have today. Many of you who check out my sermons online have heard me speak or pray to both our Father and to our brother and to our Lord Jesus in the same prayer. Am I wrong doing that? We have to talk about that. I don't believe I am wrong. I'm following examples from both the Old and the New Testaments, as I'll show you. But I'll speculate that many of you probably never pray to Jesus because that's what you've been taught. It's now a habit, a custom. I've been on a campaign to be sure we're never sidelining either father or son by our beliefs, by our actions, by what we say to people. We must include both God the Father and the Son of God in our worship and our beliefs. So I have a couple of sermons fairly recently, for example. Is it the Father? Is it the Son? So the, uh, the title is something, is it the Father, the Son, or both? So in, that, in those two sermons, and I hope you will hear them because I really believe they'll be eye-opening for most of you, giving you all the scriptures. Who is the creator? Most of you will say Jesus. The Bible says God the Father is the creator who created through Jesus. It's like Henry Ford was the one who created all those cars through his assembly lines. Scripture is very clear, Ephesians 3, 9. God created everything through Jesus Christ. John 1, 1 to 3 says Jesus created all things but other verses show that he was following the orders of his father. Both are called our Savior. God our Savior and Jesus our Savior. Both are called the God of Israel. Both. And if you're not clear on that, be sure you hear my sermons on it because I'll absolutely prove it. Now here's the link I'll put in my notes to the full sermon part one, Is it the Father, the Son, or both? And then also part two. So anyway, uh, now when we pray, let's not be sidelining Jesus Christ, the Son of God. We must not be ignoring him as we talk only to Father, as many do, as I'll clearly show you. Now, how about praying to Jesus? When I heard that group was instructed to never talk to Jesus in prayer, I found it shocking. So let's talk about it. I think a lot of the source of that issue does lie in what Jesus said when you pray, say, Our Father in heaven. So people use that as proof that Jesus himself said to pray only to God the Father. But is that the case? Let me say up front, almost every time I start my prayers by addressing my Father in heaven, probably 97% of the time I say Father in heaven or Father and then start talking, then 80 or 90 percent of my prayer time is spent talking to Father. So understand that as I talk about this. That's what I'm doing. That's what I'm used to doing. But I've learned over the, especially the last decade, that we can and we should speak to Jesus as well. Therefore, I do, and I hope you'll ponder the study with me. A lot of Protestants regularly pray to Jesus. That might be a reason some of you don't, if you're not a Protestant, if you're a Sabbath keeper. You'll hear in the Protestant prayers a lot of times, they say, Lord, thank you for this and thank you for that. And please, Lord, 
and they're and we understand they're talking to Jesus. But some Sabbath keeping groups don't seem to ever pray to Jesus, to Yeshua, his Hebrew name. They talk about him, but won't pray to him. Prayer in its simplest terms is simply speaking to God. We can be on our knees praying. We can be talking to him as we go for a walk. We can be deeply, fervently beseeching him, repenting, interceding, supplicating, and very fervent prayer. But in the end, prayer is simply communicating with God. Keep that in mind. Prayer is communicating with God. So we pray to God. Let me ask you, is Jesus not also God? And by the way, before I get too, too far into this, never, ever pray to an angel. Never, ever pray to a deceased loved one. Never. God absolutely forbids it. I remember years ago taking a tour in the Vatican and down below the main floor, you go down below, they have the, uh, where all the various popes had been buried. And I remember someone praying to John 23rd. And uh, I think that's who it was. But anyway, don't ever, ever do that. But Jesus, Yeshua, is the Son of God. He is God, as John 1, 1 to 3 and Hebrews 1, 1 to 3 clearly tell us. Now, let me ask you this, though. Would any of you ever tell an engaged woman that she is to speak only to her fiancé's father? Never, ever to her fiancé, whom she loves and will be marrying. Don't ever talk to him. Don't ever pray to him. Just the father of the fiancé. Doesn't that sound even a little strange? You and I are betrothed to Jesus. Being betrothed is a step further along than being engaged. It's our promise to marry someone. Being engaged is your intention, your stated intention to marry. Betrothed is your promise to marry. And maybe even more than that. Uh, so look at what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 11, verse 2. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 2. I, print, I put these in the notes, so if you want to print out the notes ahead of time as you listen to it, you'll have both, the audio and the scriptures. For I am jealous for you with godly jealousy. I have betrothed you, you Corinthians, you members of the church, you elect saints, I have betrothed you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. And of course, Ephesians 5, the last 10 verses, speaks a lot about how we are the bride of Christ, that we are to love our wives as our wife, as Christ loves the church and gave himself for it. We are to give ourselves for our wife. And wives are to submit to their husband as the church does to Christ. So it's very clear. We are betrothed to marry the Son of God. That should be very exciting. You might want to see my three-part sermons on wedding of the Lamb. When will it be? Who's going to be there? Where will it be? The elect believers will marry Christ. We're betrothed to him. Paul says so. But there are people telling you you're not ever to talk to your betrothed who's also the Son of God. How can that be? Somehow we're to speak only to our fiancé's father, never to the fiancé directly. That seems very strange to me. I'll show you by Scripture that it is strange. I personally feel it's such a powerful but obvious point. Surely we must talk to our fiancé, to our betrothed. But I feel it's such an obvious point, I feel I could almost quit this whole discussion just on that one point alone. But let's go deeper. Now you know you surely must be talking to, surely must be praying to, the one you're betrothed to, engaged to, promised to. Surely you see that, don't you? Even just logic before I start showing the scriptures. 
Now, we're supposed to pray to God. We're supposed to worship God. And that's why Jesus, as even a man, as a man, allowed himself from birth onwards to be worshipped because he was God. He was a fleshly man. But when the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, as John 1.14 says, he was God in the flesh. And therefore, he allowed people to worship him. It would have been a terrible sin to have anybody worship him if they couldn't worship him without sinning. Titus 2, verses 13 to 14. Looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us. So that shows us it's talking about Jesus, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people. He's the one purifying. He's the one redeeming. And most of you reading this know by now that the one called God, or Elohim in the Old Testament, or El, just E-L, or Elohim, oftentimes referred to the Word, to the one who became flesh. I think many of you know that. But most of you reading that, anyway, so many verses also speak of praying to the Lord, to the L-O-R-D, all caps. Is Jesus not also the Lord? That's part of what I said in the two-part sermon, is it the Father, the Son, or both? Absolutely he is. It can refer to God the Father, as in Psalm 110, the Lord, the uh, Yehovah, said to my Lord, Adonai. The Lord, in that case, is God the Father. But we also know that no one's seen God the Father. So look at, this, look at those sermons. So we know everything was created by God through Christ, who was the one who did the actual creating. Uh, Colossians 1, verses 15 to 18, just jot it down, look it up. And so the Lord, Jehovah, who formed Adam from the dust of the ground in Genesis 2, 7, had to be the one we know as the Christ. Couldn't be the Father, because we're clearly told in many verses that the one who did the actual work of creating was Jesus Christ. So when Adam and Eve spoke to the Lord in Genesis 3, they were praying to the one we now know as Jesus Christ. Many of you believe that the God of the Old Testament was Christ. The God who appeared to men and women and spoke to them many times indeed was the one we know as Christ. I show that again in those series, the Father, the Son, or both. Please hear that. I don't know how anyone can believe Jesus was often the one referred to as the God or the Lord, or as God, or as the, the God of Israel. But don't see that it was the same God, Jesus, <clears throat> whom those people, those prophets, those forefathers of ours, all prayed to, all through the Old Testament, as well as to the God Most High, God the Father. He's the one Most High. And in my sermon series on Father, Son, or Both, I give many scriptures to show they talked to, prayed to God Most High, the Father, and to the one we know as Jesus Christ. So in Genesis 18, when Abraham spoke to, prayed to, pleaded with Jehovah, Genesis 18, please don't wipe out everyone in Sodom if there's at least 10 righteous. That, would be, that wouldn't be fair now, would it? To wipe out the righteous with the wicked? So Abraham is talking to, praying to whom here? It wasn't God the Father because he saw this Jehovah. It was Jehovah, the Lord. Yahweh, if you want to use that term. But this is a term that's used by both God the Father and the one we know as Jesus Christ. Since he could see him and no one has seen the Father, this Jehovah had to be Jesus Christ. And he was praying to him, talking to him, please, please, is that even fair? 
Go back to Genesis 18 and look at it. Now, if Abraham could talk and pray to Jesus, surely we can do so as well. Because their lives were written down for our examples. 1 Corinthians 10, 11 says. All those things are written down for our examples. This was Yehovah, whom Abraham saw, ate with, and was speaking to. No one has seen God the Father, John 1, 18. But Abraham saw and ate with this Yehovah, who actually had come later on as Jesus. So that title, Yehovah, applies to both, depending on context. Now, the many, many times that David, <clears throat> that David prayed fervently with God, so many times, those were prayers. Those were prayers to the one who became Jesus. The one we know, whom David called and praised in that beautiful Psalm 23, the Lord, Yehovah, is my shepherd. That was Jesus. He claimed to be the good shepherd in John 10, verse 11 and 14. So many of the prayers of David to God were actually to Jesus. You all know this, but somehow we still somehow wonder if it was okay for Abraham to pray to God, for Adam to pray to God in the form of Jesus, or if David could pray to the one we know now as Jesus, it was okay for them, but not okay for us. So I'm giving you the precedent that yes, they did it as well. And the God of Israel was often actually Jesus, but still wonder if they can pray to him. I say often was Jesus because Peter made it very clear twice that he understood the God of our fathers to be God the Father who sent Jesus. Go back on your own and read Acts 3, 13, Acts 3, 13, and Acts 5, 30. The God of our fathers sent Jesus. The God of our fathers allowed him to be crucified. Allowed Jesus to be crucified. The God of our fathers resurrected Jesus. So he's saying the God of our fathers was God most high, was God the Father. And yet there are other clear verses that show that the rock that followed them was Christ and so on. It was both. Both God the Father and God the Son were the God of Israel. That's easily proven if you check my sermon out. Was it the Father, Son, or both? Remember to use the search bar and just, just uh, put in one or two key words. You can just say Father, Son, both and see what happens. So when our forefathers prayed to God in the Old Covenant, many times they were actually praying to the Word, to the one we know as Jesus, as Yeshua. I could write long chapters of examples of verbal discourses, prayers between God and man that were between God, the Word, Jesus, and man in the Old Testament. Abraham, Yahweh, in Genesis 18 is a prime example. Genesis 20. Genesis 20. Abraham hid the full truth that Sarah was indeed his half-sister, but she was also his wife. So God appeared to Abimelech, took Sarah, and God appeared, appeared, get that word in there, appeared to Abimelech in a dream saying, you're a dead man for taking Sarah to your harem. Surely since he appeared, that was the one who later became Jesus. Later, that God is the Lord, and Abraham prayed to God, and God healed them all. Read it for yourself in Genesis 20, another example where Abraham prayed to Jesus. In Numbers 21, verses 7 to 9, during a plague of snakes that God had sent for their disobedience, he had Moses build a bronze serpent. Jesus himself identified with the bronze serpent of all things to himself to show that he took our sins upon himself and became sin for us. As 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, he became sin for us that we may become the righteousness of God in him. 
Now, those were all prayers to God. Those were prayers to the one we know as Jesus. When God showed Moses his back in glory, he'd already told Moses, I can't let you see my face in glory. You won't live. That particular being still appeared, showed himself to Moses in glory, no less, even though it was just his back. But Moses prayed fervently to God, to that God, to show mercy after the gold calf debacle. Who was he praying to? That one also had to be the one we know as Jesus Christ. In Exodus 33, verses 19 to 23. <clears throat> no one has seen God in his glory, but this Lord appeared Moses to at least see his back in glory. But minus the glory, Jehovah and Moses spoke together as a man does his friend face to face. That had to be the word. The one who became Jesus, whom Moses spoke to and prayed to face to face. The entirety of De Deuteronomy 9 is a series of prayers that Moses relates about how he talked to God, prayed to God, which were clearly spoken to the word of Jesus, if you just go back and look at them. So it's no wonder that after the resurrection of Jesus Christ, Thomas wasn't there the first time he appeared to the uh, disciples. He wasn't there, but the second time he was there, and he exclaimed, he said, My Lord and my God. So, in my way of looking at things, any communication with God is a prayer. So even that exclamation was a prayer, a prayer to Jesus, who was Thomas's Lord and God. Yeshua, the birth name of Jesus Christ, is also God, as we're clearly told in John 1, 1 to 3, then the word became flesh. Now look at this one here. In Hebrews 1, verses 7 to 9. I love this. Hebrews 1, verses 7 to 9. And of the angels, he says, who makes his angels spirits and his servants, his ministers, a flame of fire. But to the Son, he says, your throne, okay, God is the one he's referring to here, God Most High, is saying to the Son, Hebrews 1, verse 8, your throne, O God, is for forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. You've loved righteousness, you've hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you. Yeah, has made you the Christ, which is what Christ means, what Messiah means, the anointed one. Therefore, God Most High has anointed you to be the Messiah, to be the Christ, with the oil of gladness more than your companions. This same Jesus is also referred to in Romans 9, verse 5, as the eternally blessed God. An angel told Joseph, the husband of Mary, that her child will be known as Emmanuel, God with us. Of course, he was called Yeshua. If any of you have a real good answer why it says that there, but Emmanuel was not what he was normally called, except just to indicate, guys, Joseph, this is God. This baby is God with you. Some of you don't believe that as a human being, he was God. He was God. He was worshipped as God. The only way you could have worshipped Jesus, and they did many times from the shepherds to the angels onwards. God with us. Isaiah 7, 14, Matthew 1, 23. Now, we pray to God. Jesus was God. Surely we can pray to Jesus as God. So are you all getting this? Of course we can. Of course we should pray to Jesus as well as God the Father. Don't sideline him. Pray to God the Father and Jesus, as our forefathers did. They also, of course, spoke to God Most High. Over and over. That's in my sermon. Was it the Father, Son, or both? Please listen to it.
Now, so are you getting it? Of course we can and should talk to him, of course. Now, New Testament examples of praying to Jesus. You might feel unconvinced so far. You're, you're, you've been taught this for so long. Your practice has always been to ignore Jesus in your prayer. Let's not ignore him in our prayers. But every time a request was made of Jesus on earth, those were prayers to Jesus Christ. Lord, will you heal my daughter? She's very sick. Lord, will you heal my son? He throws himself into the fire. Those were prayers to Jesus. Lord, will you heal us? We are blind men. And then he would say to one guy with a leprosy, do you want to be healed? He says, Lord, I know you can heal me. To the guy who was, who was uh, disabled by the pool, do you want to be made whole? Yes, Lord. Those were prayers to Jesus. Now, when Stephen, one of the first deacons, was dying as stone smashed into his head, what were his words? To whom did he pray? Acts 7, verses 59 to 60. Acts 7, 59 to 60. And they stoned Stephen, and he was calling on God, calling on God. So who was he talking to? And saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Calling on God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. He's still praying to Jesus. And when he'd said this, he fell asleep. That's clearly praying to Jesus. Another example, 1 Corinthians 2. I'm sorry, verse chapter 1, I mean, verse 2 and 3. 1 Corinthians 1, verses 2 and 3. To the church of God in Corinth, to those who are set apart for holy use, who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called saints, the words to be are in italics in your King James and New King James because it was not in the original. Called saints, they're already saints. They're not going to be to be saints. They're already holy ones. With all who in every place call on the name call on the name of Jesus Christ our Lord so yes call him Lord and yes call on him yes pray to him as Stephen did calling on God and saying Lord Jesus receive my spirit grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ two more 1 Corinthians 16, 22. If anyone does not love the, the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be accursed. O oh Lord, come. Who's he talking to there? Jesus or God the Father? That's Paul writing the book of Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 16, 22. O oh Lord, come. It's a prayer to Jesus Christ. Revelation 22, 20. John does the very same thing. He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming quickly. John says, Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. That's a prayer to Jesus Christ. Now, if you've been taught not to pray to Jesus, it will be a new experience for you to include in your prayers. It may be difficult for you, but you should do it. Don't sideline him. So when I pray to God, start with God the Father, then I'll often say something like, and now, Lord Jesus, I want to talk directly with you too. And I want to thank you for everything you've done and the way you involve yourself so much in our lives. Lord Jesus, would you please come and be my life? Would you help me overcome? It's, 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 that, kind of, it's that kind of prayer. And go from there. When I pray for healing, I speak with Father. And then I speak directly with Jesus, thanking him for being willing to go through the stripes and the scourging by whose stripes we are healed, as Isaiah 53 says and 1 Peter says. And I make sure I call on him to act in response to my prayer, to send the command from heaven 
As Lord Jesus, my hands can't heal anything, anybody, yours can. Like to the centurion, Lord Jesus, would you send your command from heaven to heal? And of course, in all of our prayers, we end each and every prayer with, in Jesus' name, amen. When we pray in Jesus' name, we're praying by the authority of Jesus Christ himself, as if Jesus was the one praying our prayer. And of course, the Holy Spirit, which is Christ in us, cleans up our prayers. And when it's presented to God the Father, it's a perfect prayer, as Romans 8 says. Now, don't overdo this. I see some about praying, about saying in Jesus' name. I had to tell our Kenyan, at least one of our Kenyan ministers, don't end all your emails with in Jesus' name. Because I don't know that you can say that. Everything you're doing is in Jesus' name. It's as if he himself have give, has given that order. So be selective about using that. But in praying for blessing on the food, praying for healing, praying for God to direct the church service, yes, in Jesus' name, amen. It, it's like Jesus himself has prayed that prayer. I know one time we are explaining this to our grandchildren, and our grandson, who's now 17, he was probably 10 or so at the time, and um, so when you say something in, in Jesus' name or in somebody's name, it's as if that person themselves, not you, are the one giving that order. Well, I was outside in the yard doing something, and Grayson came to me and said, Poppy, that's what they call me, Poppy, I'm supposed to tell you, in Nan's name, that's my wife, Nan, in Nan's name, come inside now, dinner's ready. <laughs> so in Nan's name, come in. That was a perfectly right way to use it. He was speaking as if Carol herself was telling me, please come in now. <laughs> I thought that was funny. But anyway, for those of you who don't ask in Jesus' name in your prayers, start. I'll give you some verses. John 14, verses 13 to 14. Whatever you ask in my name. John 14, 13 to 14. Whatever you ask in my name, that I will do. In my name, he says, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I'll do it. John 15, 16. You did not choose me, I chose you. And appointed you that you should go bear fruit, that your fruit should remain. That whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. In my name. John 16, verses 23 to 24. In that day you will ask me nothing. Most assuredly, I say to you, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he'll give you. Until now you've not been asking anything in my name. Ask. He's saying in my name. And you will receive that your joy may be full. That's all repeated in verse 26. So we have an awesome opportunity in the New Covenant. We can pray intimately with God the Father, God Most High, as well as to God the Son, the Son of God, your brother and your King and your Lord and your God, Jesus Christ. We can do so as we pray in Jesus' name, as if he's the one actually praying. And he will purify our prayers in Romans 8. I'll put the exact verse in, in the notes. And we should be talking directly, frequently, to our betrothed, to our fiancé, to our future husband, Jesus, the Lord of Lords, Son of God. Can you imagine being told you can talk to the fiancé's father, but not to him? I mean, go back and read the Song of Solomon, the Song of Songs. You'll see how often the bride speaks to the beloved. They call each other beloved. And they talk back and forth. That's our example. So be willing to grow in grace and knowledge. Don't sideline Yeshua, Jesus Christ. Be willing to grow in grace and knowledge. Pray in his name. Talk to him sometimes. I know it's hard to change, even when we're shown the truth. 
by praying in Jesus' name. If you've never done it, it's time to start doing it. Write me if you think I'm wrong. But I've given talks about raising holy hands in prayer, like Paul said. I would that you all pray with raising holy hands, like David did many times, like Sam, uh, Samuel did, like Solomon did, like Moses did, like Paul did. Yet most of you who are Sabbath keepers don't raise your hands in prayer. The, the um, Hebrew roots people do. Certainly Protestants, some Protestants do. Bible says do. <laughs> raise your hands. A woman's long hair is to be her head covering, not a, not a piece of cloth. 1 Corinthians 11, 15. But it's so hard for women in Africa and Kenya to give up that lifelong habit of covering their head. And certainly if it breaks their conscience, they shouldn't. But 1 Corinthians 11, 15, but we have to educate our conscience when our conscience is telling us something that's not right. But if a woman has long hair, 1 Corinthians 11, 15, verse 13 says it's a shame for a woman to pray without her head covered. Verse 15, if a woman has long hair, it's a glory to her for her hair is given to her for a covering. But I have dozens of women who are not ready for that yet. I hope they will be. Understanding that if we are a new creation in Christ, God sees us as having his, God's own righteousness. That's another thing to learn. I am the righteousness of God the Father himself through faith and in Jesus Christ. There are so many verses that say that. He became sin for us that we may become the righteousness of God in him, 2 Corinthians 5.21. I don't want my own righteousness from the Torah, Philippians 3, verses 8 to 11, but the righteousness of God by faith through Jesus Christ. And so many more in the end of Romans 3 and all of Romans 4, Romans 5, so many. But these are things, sometimes I'm just saying, these are examples of things we find hard to do because we've never done them. Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Don't sideline your betrothed. Talk to him. Ask him to be your life now, to be present in you by his spirit. And still, of course, talk primarily to God the Father as well. But don't leave out God's Messiah. Don't. That's all over, like I said, uh, the book of Romans especially. Don't sideline your betrothed. Still talk to God the Father, especially as we draw ever closer to the very last years and days. Be praying more than you ever have before. Be building your spiritual muscles more than the time you spend trying to build your physical muscles in a gym. Make praying your spiritual gym. Go for long walks or on Facebook. All these things. Don't don't what I mean by Facebook, don't don't spend more time on Facebook and social media. Okay. Um don't leave Jesus out. Don't sideline him. Be willing to learn. This is something the Bible clearly teaches. He is God. He is your betrothed. Examples of scripture show us they prayed to Jesus. Certainly Stephen did. Include him. Pray directly to him. Our Heavenly Father in heaven, we do always start our prayers to you. And we come to you gratefully and thankfully that you are God. You are our Father. You're our Abba, our dear Father, our Papa. We love you as that. And we know that you also want to glorify your Son, Jesus Christ as we do. But for some reason, many of us have been taught wrongly not to ever pray to your son, to our brother, to our betrothed, our fiance, our king, our Lord, our God, Jesus Christ. Help us to learn how to do that. Yeshua, Jesus, 
Yep, I'm going to talk to you too. We love you. We love God the Father. We love you, Yeshua. We love you, Jesus. Thank you for being there for us and being so patient with us. Please become our life. May our lives, as it says in Colossians 3, be hidden in Christ, in God. Be our life. That This is what God the Father sees, and this is what we become over time more and more. And even now, we are the righteousness of God because of you. Thank you so much. Some things are hard to accept when we've been taught against them so for so long. Thank you, Jesus, for being there for us so many times, healing so many people. Thank you, Father, for being there for us. Thank you for revealing and opening the door to your Son more than ever before. In Yeshua's mighty name, in Jesus' name, amen.